So the subject we're going to deal with today is primarily we're going to deal with the figure of the locusts, woes. There's also misunderstanding around the figure of horses. And we're going to discover some other ideas as well in this presentation that are going to help us to see that certain connections are being made that should not be made and to a religion. And then we're actually going to discover in this presentation what the real figure is for the religion of Islam. And I think that is going to be quite revealing. So with that, I'm going to pray and we'll have our discussion. Father, I come to you, name your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you always for your love and mercy to us. A mercy and love that we don't deserve. I thank you for the presentation that Brother Rao has given, the, the mystery that has been hidden, but it's it's this great love that you have for us and that you want to reveal to us through your word. It's the only way we can discover it and understand it. And beyond that is just the understanding of the times that we're in. We are the last generation. We are the people that have been appointed to live for this time. And it's a startling thing to think about that each and every one of us are vessels unto honor if we allow you to use us, however small and weak we may be, to give a message of warning to the world. How that's going to work, I don't profess to know. But I believe that you have promised it and your word cannot return void. So I just ask that you would just bless this study this evening, open up our understanding, give us wisdom, give me the words to speak that would be a blessing, fight any distractions that might try to come in among us that would not allow us to see these things by the enemy. And we just thank you that we can gather still on this platform. We believe that where two or more gather in name, that there you are in the midst because you promised this. And we commit all these things into your hands. And we pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. So when I first began to understand the concept of what would be referred to as present truth, it happened when I was in the Father-Son message. I'd been in the Father-Son message for a very short period of time. And I was tremendously blessed to start to understand things about our prophetic message. Very illuminating to me when I understood that there really was a solid position on the trumpets. And I immersed myself in the beginnings of understanding our prophetic message at that point. Um, and actually saw things very early and, and had felt that the Lord would have this come to the father son message that, that they should see these things, these prophetic truths that we held as a people. Um, and so it's been an experience of growth ever since, but what I'm realizing is on both sides of this now, whether it be the father son movement, or it would be ref what is referred to as the present truth movement, which is dealing more on the prophetic side there are just a lot of erroneous ideas on both sides. And the only way that we're going to be freed from all of that is really to return to the foundations of what made us a people. That is the Philadelphia church. And we years ago did presentations on this when I was at PHM. The ISAF, the understanding, the spiritual sign that the Laodicean needs, of which we all are in this Laodicean condition, uh, is found in the Philadelphian age, which is our pioneers. I really believe it's the first 50 years. And still even understanding that have failed myself, and so I don't boast or claim to be better than anyone else, have missed things. And so what we're going to do then is we're going to look through this evening at statements around certain figures that have been used or have been we have been told that these represent the Islamic faith or Mohammedism, the Muslim 
faith. That's what we've been told. And I adopted some of these ideas. And when you have those ideas, then it, it, it gives you a slanted understanding of things or a view on things that then would, you know, actually cause you to look at current affairs and things that are happening right now uh, through a, a lens that is corrupt. And so we want to we want to basically clean the lens, so to speak, of our understanding of figures, know exactly what they represent and mean. And then I believe that's going to be very helpful. This might have been a presentation that would have been good to do very early on, but it is what it is. Here we are. Those that will follow along this far, I believe, will see how relevant and important it is considering as we go forward. So with that, I'm going to begin to share, entitled this is, Correcting Misuse of Prophetic Figures. So we want to see that there are several prophetic figures that have been misunderstood and not put in their proper place. And the first one is locusts. How many of you have heard that locusts represent Islam? I was told this, and, and at one time I believed this, but what do the locusts really represent? We're gonna go through uh, just some foundations of our message. Of course, obviously the, we will rely heavily on the 1897 edition of Daniel Revelation. We will look at statements by Haskell, statements by William Miller. Um, I didn't pull lots of statements from other pioneers, but there is a harmony on this. So we could make a very, very long presentation if we started to pull from a lot of pioneers to do this. So we will use these main uh, 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 you know, sources to do this and, and work our way forward. So from the 1897 Daniel Revelation, we begin to read here, uh, page 497. Now I did, I did pull these quotes from an online source of Daniel Revelation. I checked to make sure that these quotes do match with my original copy that I have. So the page numbers would not align if you had an actual original Dan Revelation. But if you were sourcing this from a CD-ROM, I'm assuming even off the Ellen White estate, if you were looking at that, that are you, these page numbers should align. Okay, so we read here. The Roman emperor was not strengthened by the conquest which he achieved, and a way was prepared at the same time. And by the same means, for the multitudes of Saracens from Arabia, like locusts from the same region, who propagating in their course the dark and delusive Mohammedan creed, speedily overspread both the Persian and Roman Empire. Now, we had a problem with locusts this summer. We didn't have it so much here in the area that we live but in the city of Tirana, the capital of Albania, they were having crickets, or we would I call them crickets as an American, but locusts is really what they are. Some of these locusts were as much as, um, you know, in metric terms, five to six centimeters in inches, three to four inches, massive. I, we did see some of them around here, but they were everywhere. Okay, so... The idea of locust in the Bible, like if you if you get hit with locust, you get hit with a lot of them. OK, so right here, we already start to get a, a hint here of what the figure locusts represent is multitude, multitudes of Saracens, multitudes of Arabians. OK, Arabians that have been united, though, by a philosophy that Muhammad raised, which is also became the religion of Islam or the Muslim faith. Let's just keep going, though, and it becomes more and more clear. From 497, paragraph 5, the robbers were the apostles of Muhammad and their frantic valor emerged from the desert. 
as we read in 498 DNR, the bottomless pit. The meaning of this term may be learned from the Greek, which is defined deep, bottomless, profound, and will refer to any waste, desolate, and uncultivated place. It is applied to the earth in its original state of chaos, Genesis 1-2. In this instance, it may appropriately refer to the unknown waste of the Arabian desert, from the borders of which issued hordes of Saracens like swarms of locusts, okay? So we're already beginning to see that to say a locust represents Islam or represents a religion is not really working, okay? Uh, it's, it's actually a figure for the fact that there were so many of these united Arabs under this, uh, obviously they were under, they were united under a religious ideology. It's the religious ideology that amassed them like swarms of locusts, but it's not the religion. It is just them in general, these Arabs. We read here in the 18, uh, or in five, page 500, paragraph two, Swarms of Saracens like locusts overspread the earth and speedily extended their ravages over the Roman Empire from east to west. The hail descended from the frozen shores of the Baltic. Now, this is dealing with the first four trumpets. Um, in this, we're dealing with the fifth and sixth trumpet. Right now, we're talking about the Saracens would be under the fifth trumpet, okay, or woe. And we're going to deal with that as well because there's a bit of misunderstanding around woes. Just right now, we're just going to deal with locusts first. The burning mountain fell from the Sea of Africa, and the locusts, the fit symbol of the Arabs, issued from Arabia, their native region. Okay, it doesn't say their native religion. It says their native region. They came from Arabia, and it was a fit symbol for the massive amount of them. They came as destroyers. Now, they were propagating a new doctrine and stirred up to rapine and violence by motives of interest and religion, okay? So they had a doctrine. It was a religious doctrine, but locust does not represent that doctrine. It represents the actual people, okay? It's like the king of the north. The king of the north doesn't represent a religion. The king of the north represents a people that occupy a territory. So that's from Daniel Revelation. Let's read what Haskell has to say about this. Haskell writing in Seer from the Isle of Patmos, uh, at page 165, paragraph one, this same characteristic is emphasized in the symbols used throughout the history. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, the Saracens themselves are called locusts by the prophet John, and the doctrine which impelled their actions was a dense smoke. Now, I put here important later because smoke, and I have never heard anybody really talk about the figure of smoke and what it represents. And dealing with this issue, anyone who would even begin to understand the king of the north has some relationship to Turkey in any way. Okay, I've just not heard it. And so that will become important later on as we continue. So just keep that in mind. This was as a dense smoke issuing out of a furnace. The work of these locust-like warriors is described in the eighth plague sent upon the land of Egypt in the days when Pharaoh refused to let Israel go. I will bring the locust into thy coast and they shall cover the face of the earth that one cannot be able to see the earth and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped and shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field, and they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians. So you see, the idea of locust in the plague of locust in Egypt was that there would just be so many of them, it would just overrun and cover everything. And when you study the history of the rise of the Mohammedans through the Saracens and then to the Ottomans, just massive amounts of them overrunning anyone who got in their way. The wisdom of Solomon led him to say, the locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. In using this one figure, the divine historian tells the whole story of the Saracen conquest. 
There was no king. There was no organized government. But there was one common faith which bound the hordes of Arabia to their caliph. So it's the idea of there's just massive amounts of them. Now, they had a common faith that held them together. But locust is not a representation of the faith. It's a representation of just the massive amounts of these Arabs who at one point prior to the Mohammedan faith were basically tribal and they were segregated. This did bring them to unity of sorts. Uh, of course, it occurred later under Othman that they really then had a king over them. But anyway, we'll uh, understand that more as we continue. Um, so let's keep going here. During the years 716 to 718, a Saracen army again overran Asia Minor, crossed the Hell's Point, and for the first time landed on European soil. History states the general stood at the head of 120,000 Arabs and Persians, and that 1,800 ships approached the Bosphorus, both armies intending to attack the capital at the same moment. Again, Greek fire saved the threatened empire. The citizens of Constantinople loaded ships with combustibles, sent these into the midst of the fleet of the enemy, and the Arabs with their arms and vessels were consumed by the flames or the waves. The following winter was unusually severe, and this, together with the aid, rendered the Greeks by an army of Bulgarians and the report of still stronger forces who were arming in the west made it advisable to give up this second attempt to capture Constantinople. These were the locusts that spread over the face of the earth. Like the insect from which they are named, they devoured everything that came in their way and stung men as a scorpion stings with its tail. Again, taken from Haskell's, seer from the Isle of Patmos, uh, 169, paragraph one. Okay, so we see here locusts. Now, what does William Miller tell us about locusts? The locust denoting the Ottoman or present Turkish power says nothing about a religion, okay? And then, uh, and I, these references, I'm not exactly sure, uh, you know, what they stand for, but we can look those up. By these locusts, I understand armies, okay? So William Miller understood the figure of locusts. And then in Miller's explanation of prophetic figures, Locusts represent great armies, and the references for his proof texting that are Isaiah 33, 4, uh, Nahum 3, 15 and 17, and Revelation 9, 3 through 7. Okay, so we have dealt with one figure here, locusts, that has commonly been used to represent a religion when really it represents just armies massive amounts of armies. I mean, locusts could be applied to any massive army, okay? It's just that the Saracens, it's applied to them because it is how they came. They came like locusts. So I think that's pretty well understood, hopefully, uh, when we deal with this figure. Now, the next figure we should deal with is the figure of horse. I have and, and this will make more sense, too, as we continue further in the presentation. But I've had it said to me that horse also represents the idea of Islam. OK, and uh, this. Well, we're talking about the angry horses, a quote that they pull from a letter that she wrote to her son, Willie White. Where she references angry horse, they say, well, see, that's Islam. Islam is the angry horse. But. Let's just see what a horse represents when dealing with the Saracen or the Ottoman. So taken from 1897, Daniel Revelation, 504, paragraph 5, we read in verse 7 there, which this would be in Revelation 9, verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men. The Arabian horse takes the lead throughout the world, and skill in horsemanship is the art and science of Arabia. 
and the barbed Arabs, swift as locusts and armed like scorpions, ready to dart away in a moment, were ever prepared unto battle. So they're... The horse is indicative of their ability to handle one. Now, this makes more sense as we continue. So let's just keep reading because it, it becomes self-explanatory. Um, 505, paragraph 6 in Daniel Revelation, the sounds of their wings. The charge of the Arabs was not like that of the Greeks and Romans. The efforts of a firm and compact infantry. Their military force was chiefly formed of cavalry and archers with a touch of the hand the Arab horses darted away with the swiftness of the wind. The sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Their conquests were marvelous both in rapidity and extent, and their attack was instantaneous, nor was it less successful against the Romans than the Persians. The heads of the horses were in appearance as the heads of lions to denote their strength, courage, and fierceness, while the last part of the verse undoubtedly has reference to the use of gunpowder and firearms for the purposes of war, which were then but recently introduced as the Turks discharged their firearms on horseback. So they're riding horses. Horses do not denote that it's a religion, okay? The horse is not uh, indicative of religion, and we'll see that. Uh, with Haskell, even with, with William Miller, and what a horse represents figuratively in the Bible. Um, so in Haskell, writing from Seer of Patmos uh, in 169 paragraph 2, they went as Solomon said of the locust, in bands without a king. The dash of the Arab cavalry is proverbial in history. Arabia is considered to be the home of the horse. And Gibbon says... These horses are educated in the tents among the children of the Arabs with a tender familiarity, which trains them in the habits of gentleness and attachment. They are accustomed only to walk or to gallop. Their sensations are not blunted by the incessant abuse of the spur and the whip. Their powers are preserved for the moments of flight and pursuit. But no sooner do they feel the touch of the hand or the stirrup than they dart away with the swiftness of the wind. And if their friend be dismounted in the rapid career, they instantly stop till he has recovered his seat. Since so much of the success of these human locusts depend upon the steeds which they rode, it is not surprising that the prophet John saw them like unto horses prepared unto battle. So human locusts, all right? So they, again, not a religion. We, we already discussed locusts, but they are riding on horses. So this, like I said, will make more sense as we continue, uh, as I have seen how certain ideas in present truth are trying to use the horse or the symbol of the horse to represent Islam here at the end, uh, doing something, you know, with verse 45, of which we see there's a historical fulfillment. So we want to clear up this confusion. Uh, this last statement here with uh, Haskell, uh 171 paragraph one enough has been said to show the vividness of the prophetic description of the charge of the arab cavalry who were armed with smiters uh protected by cuirasses and seated on horses swift as the wind okay so the horse is just merely what they use to fight in battle and i i mean i remember when i was little I went to summer camp and they had a horseback riding program there. We could ride horses and, you know, the coveted horse, I understood even as a young age is an Arabian, you know, an Arabian is just, it's, it's just a, a the best horse that you can have. And I'm sure that, or maybe we have a brother or CD on the call. Maybe he would disagree. I don't know, <laughs> but, but as far as just for swiftness and, and uh, trainability and beauty uh, power, these horses, this is what carried them into battle, and this is what gave them such an advantage over anyone they fought against. They swarmed in like locusts on these horses that were so well-trained and prepared for battle that it gave them an overwhelming advantage. William Miller, in talking about uh, the uh, nature of this prophetic figure, 
in his explanation is a horse represents war and conquest. And the proof text there is Proverbs 21, 31 and Jeremiah 8, 6. So horse can also represent war, okay, or conquest. And of course, that is exactly what we saw happen here as we read that these horses were used, uh, the Arabian horse used for conquest by the Saracens and Ottomans. Now we should talk about woe, because this is where it gets interesting, if you ask me, because what I have heard, and perhaps you've heard this too, is the idea as well, the fifth woe, or the fifth trumpet was Islam, the sixth trumpet is Islam, and so therefore the seventh trumpet is Islam, and the woe is basically Islam. Or the religion of Islam. Is that what it really is? That's not what we're going to see as the pioneers would have understood it. And so let's read now from Daniel Revelation 493 paragraph 4. Fearful as were the calamities brought upon the empire by the first incursions of these barbarians, they were comparatively light as contrasted with the calamities which were to follow. There were but as the preliminary drops of a shower before the torrent, which was soon to fall upon the Roman world. The three remaining trumpets are overshadowed with the cloud of woe as set forth in the following verses. Now, keep that in mind. The first four trumpets, okay, they fall upon Western Rome. And we'll see that here. We have a chart that we'll look at this evening. The first four trumpets fall upon Western Rome, and they were bad, okay? But these last three trumpets, the fifth, sixth, and seventh, okay, falling, well, the fifth and sixth, we will see fall on Western Rome. The seventh trumpet falls on the world, and they're especially grievous. So let's just keep reading, and we're going to see what how this works. So in verse 13 there, then, from uh, Revelation chapter 9, and I beheld and heard... An angel fly through the midst of heaven. Actually, it would be Revelation chapter 8, I believe, the end of Revelation chapter 8. Then I beheld and heard an angel fly through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of these three angels, which are yet to sound. This angel is not one of the series of the seven trumpet angels, but simply one who announces that the three remaining trumpets are woe trumpets, on account of the more terrible events to transpire under their sounding. Thus, the next or fifth trumpet is the first woe, the sixth trumpet is the second woe, and the seventh, the last one in this series of the seven trumpets, is the third woe. So we see here that the pioneers, okay, those that understood and studied this out, did not separate the woe from the trumpet, okay? They're one in the same. It's just that the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet are especially grievous, more grievous as compared to the first four. Therefore, they're called woes. But we don't separate them from each other. That is, that is a mistake that is made. And it's that separation that is allowed for this confusion that we see right now around anyone who might even understand that the king of the north is Turkey in any form or fashion. Now, we know clearly the king of the north is the Ottoman Turkish Empire. That's who it is. That's the figure it represents, okay? But anybody who would even come close to making that kind of association, and I was guilty of this myself. Believe me, I was very guilty of this. It's just like we have the trumpet, but inside of the trumpet we have the woe, and the woe is the religion. No. No. That's not the case, and we're not going to see it to be the case as we continue to follow this out. For an exposition of this trumpet, we shall again draw from the writings of Mr. Key. This writer truthfully says, there is scarcely so uniform an agreement among interpreters concerning any other part of the apocalypse as respecting the application of the fifth and sixth trumpets or the first and second woes to the Saracens and Turks. It is so obvious that it can scarcely be misunderstood. Instead of a verse or two designating each, the whole of the ninth chapter of Revelation in equal portions is occupied with a description of both. The Roman Empire declined as it arose by conquest, 
But the Saracens and the Turks were instruments by which a false religion became the scourge of an apostate church. And hence, instead of the fifth and sixth trumpets like former or like the former being designated by that name alone, they are called woes. Okay, the cause, the way the Lord used the Saracens and the Turks against apostate Christianity was very grievous. Okay, and <laughs> under the seventh trumpet of which is now sounding, we're living under the woe now. And when Jesus finally comes and deals with apostate Christianity and the wicked of this world, it's going to be especially grievous. Now, another idea I should share in all of this is we must keep in mind that the woe itself, it runs throughout the whole time of the sounding of the trumpet. It's not like a, 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 a part of it, a small part of it or a fraction of it is woe, and then the rest of it is trumpet. It is all together one and the same. Let's keep reading, though, and we see that this is just what comes out. Uh, in verse 5 of Daniel 9, uh, excuse me, of, of Revelation chapter 9, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. Their constant incursions into the Roman territory and frequent assaults on Constantinople itself were an unceasing torment throughout the empire, and yet they were not able effectually to subdue it, notwithstanding the long period afterward more directly alluded to during which they continued by unremitting attacks, grievously to afflict an idolatrous church of which the Pope was the head. Their charge was to torment and then to hurt, but not to kill or utterly destroy. The marvel was that they did not. In reference to the five months, we see verse 10. So, so it's just that this fifth trumpet, and this is what we're talking about right now, is the fifth trumpet or the, the first woe, is, it was just grievous like they were constantly being bombarded by the saracens okay like locusts they weren't able to overcome them but they were constantly tormenting them never leaving them in any kind of peace at least not for very long that sounds like the world today doesn't it <laughs> there's no such thing as any kind of peace in the world today for very long because she kind of kind of clue you in Anyway, verse six reads, and in those days, men shall seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Men were weary of life when life was spared only for a renewal of woe. And when all that they accounted sacred was violated and all that they held dear constantly endangered and the savage Saracens domineered over them or left them only a momentary repose ever liable to be suddenly or violently interrupted as if by the sting of a scorpion. This is taken from Dan Revelation 504, paragraph four. I mean, think about it. You know, you're living in your home, okay? And you just never know when an attack is gonna come. You know, and for 150 years, which is a part of the fifth trumpet or the woe, 150 years of this, no peace, never know. Like. You know, never know when you're going to walk out of your house and you're going to be attacked. That's how this was. That's why it was especially grievous. It was a woe. That has nothing to do with the religion, okay? It just has to do with the nature of how grievous the trumpet is. Near the close of the 13th century, Othman founded the government, which has since been known as the Ottoman government or empire, which grew until it extended all over the principal Mohammedan tribes, consolidating them into one grand monarchy. His name in Hebrew, Abaddon, the destroyer. In Greek, Apollyon, one that exterminates or destroys, having two different names in two languages. It is evident that the character, rather than the name of the power, is intended to be represented. If so, as expressed in both languages, he is a destroyer. Such has always been the character of the Ottoman government. Doesn't say Ottoman religion, does it? doesn't say the character of the Islamic faith. It just has to do with the way the people were, okay? So we continue to read here in DNR on page 507, paragraph four. Um, 
Commencing July 27, 1299, the 150 years reached to 1449. During that whole period, the Turks were engaged in an almost perpetual warfare with the Greek Empire, but yet without conquering it. They seized upon and held several of the Greek provinces, but still Greek independence was maintained in Constantinople. But in 1449, the termination of the 150 years, a change came, the history of which will be found under the succeeding trumpet. Now we're going to enter into discussing the sixth trumpet. Now keep in mind, I'm just pulling sections, okay? Uh, we're not really trying to do a, a, an in-depth study on the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet. We're just trying to show that the figure of woe cannot be made a religion, okay? It cannot be made Islam, okay? Because that is the logic I have heard used. Since it was Islam in the fifth trumpet and it was Islam in the sixth trumpet, it's going to be Islam in the seventh trumpet. It'll be the, the woe. Uh, that, that cannot work, and we're going to see that. It just becomes more and more clear as we continue. Taken from Daniel Revelation 5.17, paragraph 2, God designs that men shall make a note of his judgments and receive the lessons he thereby designs to convey. But how slow are they to learn? And how blind are the indications of providence? The events that transpired under the sixth trumpet constituted the second woe. Yet these judgments led to no improvement in the manners or morals of men. Now, we know the sixth trumpet, it lasted how long? It lasted 391 years and 15 days. And the whole time, God was allowing judgments and, uh, you know, things to happen to these apostate Christians, i.e. the Catholics, okay, especially the Catholics, and, and they just didn't learn. Let's just keep reading. Those who escaped them learned nothing by their manifestation in the earth, the worship of devils, demons, dead men deified, and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood may find a fulfillment in the saint worship and image worship of the Roman Catholic Church, while of murders, sorceries, pretended miracles through the agency of departed saints, fornications and thefts in countries where the Roman religion has prevailed, there has been no lack. The hordes of Saracens and Turks, like locusts, were let loose as a scourge and punishment upon apostate Christendom. Men suffered the punishment, but learned therefrom no lesson. They didn't learn anything from it. So this is, well, we have more to deal with when we look at a woe. Well, no, we don't. That is uh, from Daniel Revelation. Okay, so that's, we we dealt primarily Daniel Revelation on this. So we see clearly from just these statements from Daniel Revelation that you don't separate woe from the trumpet. It is the whole thing. Okay, it's just an especially grievous trumpet. And the woe itself runs through the whole trumpet. Keep that in mind, okay? It's the whole thing is a woe. From its beginning all the way to its end, it is a woe. It's a hardship. And we see from the fifth and sixth trumpet or the first and second woe that men didn't learn anything from it. Christendom, apostate Christendom, didn't learn any lessons, in other words. Now, we need to deal with the figure of angry horse. Okay, um, now this, this idea came to me about two years ago now. Someone sent me a study about the angry horse. Uh, this was brought up to me just recently by somebody who's teaching the idea that verse 45 is yet fulfilled or to be fulfilled by Turkey going to Israel. And it, they use the angry horse idea. But before we deal with this angry horse figure, that they want to say represents Islam and is going to be let loose on the world somehow, some way. Let's just uh, let's just deal with how Ellen White says her writings should be viewed or looked at, or what should be taken into account, and what should I would not say not taken into account, but just don't pin a doctrine on something that she said unless it comes from a certain source. So let's just see how that works. So she says, and this is taken from 5 Testimonies 695, paragraph 1. There are many who put their own construction upon what they hear. 
making the thought appear altogether different from that which the speaker endeavored to express. Some hearing through the medium of their own prejudices or prepossessions understand the matter as they desire it to be, as will best suit their purpose and so report it, following the promptings of an unsanctified heart, they construe into evil that which rightly understood might be a means of great good. I mean, that's the principle right now that we're dealing in, actually. That's what we're seeing happening right now. Again, an expression perfectly true and right in itself may be wholly distorted by transmission through several curious, careless, or cavalling minds. Well-meaning persons are often careless and make grievous mistakes, and it is not likely that others will report more correctly. One who has himself not fully understood a speaker's meaning repeats a remark or assertion, giving his own coloring. It makes an impression on the hearer, just according to his prejudices and imaginings. He reports it to a third who in turn adds a little more and sends it forward. And before any of them are aware of what they are doing, they have accomplished the, person of, the purpose of Satan in planting the seeds of doubt, jealousy, and suspicion in many minds. Brethren, this is what's taking place right now around this whole thing right now with Daniel 11, verse 45. I mean, honestly, I mean, you couldn't describe it better than what's being described here. But we're trying to get to another place, but just in principle, we see that we are dealing in exactly what she's saying here. If persons listen to God's message of reproof, warning or encouragement, while their hearts are filled with prejudice, they will not understand the true import of that which was sent them to be a savor of life and life. Satan stands by to present everything to their understanding in a false light. But the souls that are hungry and thirsting for divine knowledge will hear aright and will obtain the precious blessing that God designs to convey to them. Their minds are under the influence of his Holy Spirit and they hear aright. Okay, well, there's a promise right there. The devil will not be able to deceive God's sincere children. Okay, they will come to understand the truth of the matter. Praise the Lord. As unworthy as I am, the worm that I am, chief of sinners that I am, I am grateful that the Lord has counted me worthy to understand and share these things with you, to share the truth, okay? But God's true children will come to understand things in a right fashion. So then it says, when hearts are purified from selfishness and egotism, they are in harmony with the message God sends them. The perceptions are quickened. The sensibilities refined. Like appreciates like. He that is of God heareth God's words. You know, I was having a conversation with a brother today and we were talking about some things. And I said, you know, what's amazing is that it's like I got involved in, a, in I, I don't, you know, I don't want to pick on anybody. And there's so many factions in the father son movement, but there's this one faction that I got involved in for a little bit. And it was like, you know, they were professing that they were presenting the Sabbath more fully. And it was a mighty manifestation of the spirit of God of understanding these things. And, you know, and, and I mean, I had some nice fellowship with his brother. Don't get me wrong. But when I began to understand present truth, like aspects of our prophetic message, and I began to share these ideas with them, it was like I became Freddie Four Toes overnight. OK, <laughs> I was no longer their friend anymore. And it was like. It, it was it was a similar experience that I'd had that, that I saw before I even entered into the father son message. And it was like this. It's like, well, if well, I'll, I'll just share the story real quick. I was in a place called Coastal Seventh Day, Coastal Seventh Day Adventist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. And the man, the pastor would stand up there and he would say, we are spirit led and Holy Ghost fed. But yet, you know, the women were in mini skirts and, you know, at potluck, they were eating meat. I mean, I'm not, you know, it just, but it was just like, wait, something's not aligning here. Like, you know, if, if they're being led by the spirit of God, then why are they not understanding certain principles of what it really means to be a seventh day Adventist? I mean, you know, why are they acting this way? Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's contrary. And so this was the same thing in this, in this, you know, experience I had with trying to share this now after being in the father son message and understanding, you know, aspects of our prophetic message. And I'm like, trying to share it with these people and they're just like totally rejecting it, totally not seeing it. And I'm thinking, if this was of the Lord, they would hear God's words. Like, why do they not, if they say they are of the truth, then why do they not hear the truth? So here we see this principle right here in this statement. He that is of God, 
heareth God's words. And now to all who have a desire for truth, I would say, do not give credence to unauthorized or, un, excuse me, unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her published works. Are there any points of interest concerning which she has not written? Do not eagerly catch up and report rumors as to what she has said. Now, here's the thing. We need to know what that is. What are her published works? When she says, read her published works, what are they? Now, I'm not saying that we can't read things that were not necessarily published and find things that are important and valid and true and helpful. I'm not saying that we don't do that, okay? I'm not saying you can't read letters and you can't read, you know, uh, whatever. I'm not saying that. But she's making a very clear statement that if you really want to know what the Lord's revealed to her expressly, especially if you're going to try to build a doctrine, brethren, you got to do it through her published works. Okay, so what are they? Well, she's going to tell you. She's going to tell you in uh, Special Testimonies 49, uh, paragraph 3. The time will come when I must speak much more plainly and warn our brethren in plain tones not to be led astray with the false theories of living temple. Now, that was Kellogg. Okay, we all under should understand that. We're father-son believers, and Kellogg is the one who really set the foundations for bringing the Trinity into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, and with the help of Prescott and Daniels, uh, assisting him, and then ultimately Wagner and Jones joining along, you know, that's why we're all here today having this discussion, okay? But there's other problems as well besides the father-son message. That's not the only white elephant in the room. But anyway, we read here, I have been shown the seductive nature of the sentiments it contains, and that which has been declared over and over again, I need not repeat. These representations are said to be in harmony with the sentiments in Sister White's published works, those who make such or those who make statements such as this are doing what? What is your my books? Great injustice. Let all bar, all let all bear in mind that statements from my books may be taken out of their setting and placed in such connection as to make it appear that the sentiments in Living Temple are sustained by Sister White's very words. So she tells you what her published works are. She says her published works are her books. We can understand then that her published works are her books. And so that's why I put here point, exclamation point, published works are not letters. Is it wrong to read her letters? No, I don't think it's wrong to read her letters. I don't think it's wrong to read her sermons and these things at all. I don't think that's a bad thing at all, but it's not necessarily published works. So why am I doing this? Well, remember, we're dealing with this idea of an angry horse. Okay, let's keep that in mind. We're dealing with this angry horse thing. So where does this idea of this angry horse that has been used and is being used by many in the present truth movement to try to say that it is Islam is the angry horse that will rise up and fulfill verse 45, which has already been fulfilled. So a letter that was written to her son, Willie White, June 10th, 1897 from Sunnyside, she writes in this letter. Now, this is this statement is only made one time in a letter, and they're, they're using a letter and a one-time statement to build a doctrine, okay? So we just got to keep this in mind. Can we really do such a thing? Just as long as those who profess the truth are serving Satan, his hellish shadow will cut off their views of God and heaven. They will be as those who have lost their first love. They cannot view eternal realities. That which God has prepared for us is represented in Zechariah chapter 3. Now, if you know what Zechariah chapter 3 is talking about, and he showed me Joshua. See, this Joshua. For some reason, I was thinking Isaiah. He shows me Joshua. So he sees Joshua, right, in Zechariah 3, and uh, he's standing before the angel of the Lord, and, of course, he's in a filthy garment, okay? I'm not going to go through the whole chapter of Zechariah 3, but that, that is representative, actually, of us and how the Lord is going to remove the filthy garment from us, just like he did from Joshua, and clothe us in a garment of righteousness. And then the reference of Zechariah 4, but especially Zechariah 4, verses 12 through 14. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which... 
through the two golden pipes, emptied the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a pause here in this as we're looking at the angry horse, because as I was preparing this and reading through Daniel Revelation is also using Haskell, um, I came across this nugget that I have never come across before. And uh, in dealing with what Zechariah 4 represents. So I want to read this, what Haskell says around Zechariah 4, because it's couched in all of this uh, in dealing with the, the trumpets, the fifth, six trumpets. So Haskell writing in Seer on the Isle of Patmos, 195 paragraph two. In the East, the Quran wholly replaced the Bible. In the West, God said, I will give power unto my two witnesses that they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. For 1260 years, days, the light of God was hidden as beneath a covering of sackcloth. Men think that with the advanced knowledge of the 20th century, human reason has outgrown the word of God. But history proves without a shadow of a doubt that when the word is replaced by the products of man's mind, both moral and intellectual darkness are brought upon the world. In this darkness, the balances were held by those who believed that man was above God, that reason was the ultimate standard for judgment. But at that very time, God was measuring character by the measuring reed of heaven, the law which man in his blindness had set aside. Now watch this. The two witnesses are the Old and New Testaments. Okay, they're not angels, brethren. They're the Bible. In the mouth of the two witnesses, every word is established. The Old Testament told of God, who strove to live in man. The New Testament told of God, who had lived in the human form, and the two agree. Man, what a statement. Let me read that one again. The Old Testament told of the God who strove to live in man. In the New Testament told of the God who had lived in the human form, and the two agree. The same mystery is revealed to each individual heart in the providences of God. Christ, the God-man, sat on the curbing of Jacob's well at the hour of noon when the Samaritan woman came to draw water. Likewise, the divine spirit drew the woman of Samaria to the well at the very hour when the Son of Man was there. These two witnesses agree. They agree in lives today. When the spiritual eye is open, the testimony of the two witnesses will be accepted. Okay, so when people will war against the word of God as not being the voice of God to them, then you can understand that their spiritual eyes are not open. They're blind. Even if they profess, they see. And this is a real problem in our movement, brother. But I digress. Let's keep going. For they are the two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes emptied the golden oil out of themselves. By the prophet Zechariah, the church is represented as a golden candlestick having seven branches, each bearing aloft a light for the world. These seven branches receive their oil from a single bowl, and the oil for this bowl is supplied by the two olive trees on either side. The purity of the oil they burn is represented by the close connection with living, growing trees. This oil is the oil of grace, the truth of God. Now, that can only be found in the word of God. The unity of the seven candlesticks is typified by the common bowl from which each gains its supply of oil. How beautiful a picture of the work of God's word in ministering to the needs of the church on earth. Life flows from the old as well as the New Testament to those whose hearts are open channels for the spirit. When connection with the living trees is severed, spiritual death is the result. So when we become disconnected from God's word, Spiritual death will be the result. So if we have people teaching that just believe on Jesus and then not connecting them to the word of God, they're not really alive, are they? The lights may burn for a time, but they soon exhaust the supply in the bowl and gradually the flame dies out. Extinguishing a light does not affect the olive trees. Indeed, they are trees of life guarded by flaming swords like the tree of life in the Garden of Eden after the fall. And the flashes of light destroy the life of those who lift a hand against the witnesses, that being the word of God. Men may claim to receive light independently of these witnesses, 
but there are no channels for the communication of the spirit of wisdom and knowledge except these two trees or some of their branches through which the life, the golden oil is constantly flowing. So either you're going to get the truth directly from the word of God or a minister, i.e. myself, ministering from the word of God can bring oil to you. All right? But ultimately, it will fall on you to be connected to the word of God. You can't just rely on a man, okay? We are merely like someone like myself, i.e., or hopefully yourselves as well as you minister in the sphere of influence that God has given you. You are signposts to drive people to the word of God to receive the oil for themselves from the spirit of God, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the word. It is thus they have power to stay the heavens that it rain not. It is for this reason that the three and a half years of drought of the days of Elijah are used by the divine historian to illustrate the three and a half prophetic years. The 1260 years of darkness brought about by severing the connection between the church and the two witnesses. Okay, so the church went into darkness because it was separated from the word of God. When the connection was broken, the restraining power of God was withdrawn. And as in the natural world, so in the spiritual, there was nothing to prevent bloodshed, famine, and persecution. The time of great persecution was the period during which the witnesses prophesied covered with sackcloth. The Reformation removed the sackcloth from the two witnesses from the close of the 14th century when Wycliffe's translation placed the word of God in the hands of the common people of England until the full dawn of the Reformation, the restraint which had been long placed upon the scriptures was gradually removed. The light was spread largely through the schools in Germany. The University of Wittenberg made the study of the word its most prominent feature. And at the educational centers in England, Germany, and France, the heralds of truth received their inspiration and their training. In the preparation of laborers, the scriptures formed the basis of all instruction. And as the classics and false sciences of the dark ages gave way to the Bible as a textbook, so the former lifeless, formal, lifeless methods of theological instruction were exchanged for teaching which fed the souls of the students. Now, we dealt extensively in the past with the word of God in relation to angels and this angel doctrine that's in this father-son movement. And I'm not going to go there because I've dealt with it in the past. But the thing about it is, is this. If angels could have brought the word of God during the dark ages to those that sincerely wanted to hear from God, then why was there a dark ages? Why was there basically all the problems? Because the word of God was taken away. And once the word of God was restored, the light came and the reformation flourished. So a little caveat in all of this that I found as I was dealing with this, but now let's get back to this letter where this figure that they have tried to use called the angry horse. Remember, it's a letter written June 10th in 1897, letter 138, written to Willie White. The Lord is full of resources. He has no lack of facilities. It is because of our lack of faith, our earthliness, our cheap talk, our unbelief manifested in our conversation that dark shadows gather about us. Man, excellent, excellent advice. Wonderful in principle. Christ is not revealed in word or character as one altogether lovely and the cheapest among 10,000. When the soul is content to lift itself up into vanity or unto vanity, the spirit of the Lord can do little for it. Our short-sighted vision beholds the shadow, but cannot see the glory beyond. Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse, seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. And so this is what someone said to me the other day. They say, see, the angry horse, represented as an angry horse, the horse on the chart. The horse is Islam, and the angry horse is the horse that goes forward as the woe of the seventh trumpet. And they use one statement 
from a letter to Willie White. Now, granted, there's wonderful things in that letter, but is that letter of her published works? It's not her published works, and it's only made one time. So can we build a doctrine around this one statement called angry horse and say, okay, well, there's an angry horse on the chart. Well, we've already seen that a horse represents conquest or war, right? Not a religion. And can we then, do you, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. You can see it. It's like, it's, it's, it's actually, it's absurd to do such a thing. But this is what they've done. And it's, it's caused a lot of confusion. I mean, I've had this objection thrown at me by about three different people. The angry horse. I hope we can see that it just doesn't really work. And we shouldn't use a letter, uh, you know, which is not a part of her published works, to do such a thing. So I write here, it's a letter. <laughs> it's not a published work. It occurs one time in all her writings. We don't build a doctrine with it. Second Corinthians 13, 1, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. We just can't do it. Okay, so we've almost come to the end of this presentation. So what does represent the religion of Islam or Mohammedism, uh, the Muslim faith? What, what is it? What is the figure for it? Well, let's look at the figure of smoke. Because that is your figure for the religion of Islam. In Daniel Revelation, on page 498, paragraph 3, we read, Like the noxious and deadly vapors which the winds, particularly from the southwest, diffuse in Arabia, Mohammedism spread from thence its, pestilence in, its pestilential influence, arose as suddenly and spread as widely as smoke arising out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace. Such is a suitable symbol of the religion of Mohammed. So now, finally, we get told in our writings very clearly what represents Islam. What is its figure? What is its symbol? Smoke. Of itself, or as compared with the pure light of the gospel of Jesus, it was not, like the latter, a light from heaven, but a smoke out of the bottomless pit. Taken from Daniel Revelation 498, paragraph 3. Now, Haskell writing on this and seer patmos who writes muhammad's one design was to capture constantinople peace was on his lips but war was in his heart and every energy was bent towards the accomplishment of this design <clears throat> at midnight he once started from his bed and demanded the immediate attendance of his prime visor or vi visor the man came trembling fearing the detection of some previous crime he made his offering to the sultan but was met with the words, I ask a present far more valuable and important, Constantinople. Muhammad II tested the loyalty of his soldiers, warned his ministers against the bribery of the Romans, studied the art of war and the use of firearms. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about this history here. Um, 260,000 Mohammedans went against Constantinople after this. And they used firearms and the cannon to take down Constantinople and finally conquer it. 260,000, like locusts. It's estimated that over the course of the sixth trumpet or the second woe, 200 million, 200 million Ottomans, Saracen, Mohammedans, however you want to identify them, okay, were fighting against the apostate Roman Empire of the West, okay? So they were like locusts, but we've already discussed that. Let's deal with the figure for the religion. He engaged the services of a founder of Canaan who promised weapons that could batter down the walls of the city. In April, 1453, the memorial siege was formed or the memorial siege was formed. At the sound of the war of trumpet, the forces of Muhammad II were increased by swarms of fearless fanatics until, as Fanzra has said, the besieging army numbered 258,000. Constantinople fell. 
the last vestige of Roman greatness was gone. The Muslim conquerors trampled the religion of Rome in the dust. This memorable event affected all future history, even to this day. The fall shocked Europe, and the convulsions had not passed before the light of the Reformation broke the darkness which shrouded the Western Empire. While the smoke from the bottomless pit was settling over the east, streaks of light heralded a coming dawn in the nations of Europe. So the smoke of the religion of Islam settling over the east, streaks of light, the truth of the gospel dawning on the nations of Europe. Again, taken from Haskell, because then he further clarifies here on page 192, paragraph one of Seer of Patmos. The smoke from the bottomless pit, pit beclouded the eastern sky and the consideration of the Eastern Empire necessitates a study of Mohammedanism instead of Christianity. And then he says here in uh, the next paragraph, during this period, the smoke of Mohammedanism hid the light of the sun in the east. Mohammedanism in the east and the man of sin in the west brought uh, both brought darkness and despair. Mohammedanism tormented men like the sting of a scorpion and the man of sin held men's minds in such subjection that they saw nothing above the exalted man on the throne. Smoke represents the Muhammad faith, Islam. Josiah Litch, writing on this, smoke denotes errors and locust destructive armies. Muhammad, after he and his accomplices had framed their system, began at first to propagate his religion by peaceable means, but not succeeding to his mind, he soon began to mediate more violent measures and to do by the sword what he could not do by argument. They, the armies of Muhammad, had power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They tormented men by their sudden attacks and the wounds and tortures which they inflicted. It was commanded that they should not hurt the grass. Josiah Litch clearly understands it. Smoke denotes air, smoke den denoting the false religion of Islam, okay? William Miller, the bottomless pit, which denotes the theories of men or devils that have no foundation in the word of God. Smoke denotes the errors from such doctrine. So if we want to figure for the Islamic religion, then here we have it. It's smoke, and I have yet to hear anyone thus far, and I've been around this for a while now, going on almost eight years, and I have listened to a lot of different people talk about uh, the turkey and verse 45, and I have never heard them once use the figure that smoke represents the religion. I've heard them use woe, I've heard them use locust, I've now heard angry horse, but I've never heard them use the word smoke. So now we need to close with the third woe because this is where we are now. Haskell, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to cite Haskell first in this because of the way he explains it in this paragraph is, is uh, very clear, very concise. We'll also look at Daniel Revelation. But uh, in Seer of the Patmos, page 205, paragraph two. In 1844, the third woe began. Now, as we said, the third woe now, we... If you're kind of in the, you know, in the loop of all this, the third woe is, is being propagated. That's Islam. Okay. It's going to be some kind of Islamic attack. And not only just on Jerusalem, but also on the whole world, basically. You know, okay, because because now Islam is basically everywhere. So third woe is Islam. And I know that because I at one time believed it and even said it myself. So I, I'm not going to claim that I'm not was not guilty of this idea because I was but it's false. It's not true. In 1844, the third woe began. Now remember, the woes run all the way through the whole time frame that they're associated with. So in the fifth trumpet, it was a woe from its beginning to its end. In the sixth trumpet, it was a woe from its beginning to its end. And with the seventh trumpet, it will be a woe from its beginning all the way to its end. And this is going to become very clear in a moment. 
In 1844, the third woe began. It extends into eternity, covering all the corruption of the last days of which we're living in. The anger or distress among nations, which was one sign of the second advent as given by the Savior during the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The seven last plagues are poured out. Men having rejected God, drink of the wine of his wrath. During the sounding, the righteous and the wicked pass through the last great time of trouble. In comparison with which the reign of terror in France was a light affliction. During this woe, the saints of God welcome the Lord in the clouds of heaven, for he comes to give reward to the faithful. This period continues over 1,000 years following the second coming of Christ and ends when Satan and all the wicked are reduced to ashes upon the surface of the new earth and all sorrow and sin are forever vanquished. And so here I put chart. So let's just look at a, a visual of this. Okay, this is taken from Bible readings from the home circle. Okay, so here we see that, you know, the first, second, and third trumpet, I mean, and fourth trumpet, okay, and what it is dealing with as we are looking at the fall of Western, of the Western Roman Empire and over its period, and then we have talked about the fifth trumpet or the first woe, sixth trumpet being the second woe, and then there's this interim, okay, between the ending of the sixth trumpet on August 11th, 1840, okay, where we have this moving in this time no longer or quickly. And then 1844, the seventh trumpet begins to sound or the seventh woe begins. And this woe will go all the way to the destruction of the wicked. It ends at the new heaven and the new earth when our heavenly father makes all things new. So it's running the whole time. So, as foretold in the scriptures, the ministration of Christ in the most holy place began at the termination of the prophetic days in 1844. The words of the revelator apply to this time. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in this temple the ark of his testament at the beginning of the work of the investigative judgment. When Christ entered the most holy place, the door in heaven was opened. And the law of God was seen as the foundation of his throne. It was immediately after the bitter disappointment of 1844, when earnest souls were still searching the scriptures, that the sacredness of the law was revealed. As the Decalogue was presented, a special glory shown about the fourth commandment. The seal of the law stood out as if written in letters of fire, and a new significance was given to the measuring reed, which the angel offered. Okay, so that's Haskell. Now let's read from Daniel Revelation on this. And we're beginning to close this up now. We're coming to the end of this presentation. Um, on page 538, paragraph two, okay, verse 14, okay, and this would be now actually in Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The series of seven trumpets is here again resumed. The second woe ended with the sixth trumpet, August 11th, 1840, and the third woe occurs under the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which commenced in 1844. So the woe began in 1844. Then where are we? Behold, that is to say, mark it well. The third woe cometh quickly. The fearful scenes of the second woe are past, and we are now under the sounding of the trumpet that brings the third and last woe. And shall we now look for peace and safety, a temporal millennium, a thousand years of righteousness and prosperity? Rather, let us earnestly pray the Lord to awaken a slumbering world. But the seventh trumpet, like the preceding six, covers a period of time. It covers through the whole period not just part of it, okay? So we don't say, well, we got this, we're under the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and in the midst of the sounding of this seventh trumpet, there's like this little somewhere space in it before Christ comes that this woe is going to happen with Islam. And we're calling that verse 45. That's an erroneous teaching. That's error. And the transfer of the kingdoms from earthly power to him whose right it is to reign is the principal event to occur in the early years of its sounding. Hence, this event, to the exclusion of all else, here engages the mind of the prophet. Then we read in verse 18, the nations were angry. That's a part of the woe that we're living in. The nations are angry. And thy wrath is come. 
and the time of the death they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. So the nations are angry before Jesus Christ comes. The nations were angry, commencing with the wonderful revolution in Europe in 1848, that spontaneous outburst of violence among the nations. Their anger toward one another, their jealousy and envy have been constantly increasing. Almost every paper shows the fearful degree to which they are now excited and how tense has become the strain on relations between them. So, brethren, the nations are angry. They started to be angry as our pioneers understood in 1848 as the seventh trumpet or the third woe began. So major wars and conflicts that have taken place around the world since 1844. And I'm not going to actually read the explanations of each and every one of these. We'll just go through them. Uh, you can, you know, pause it or however, when it, when it comes out and you can read these, but we have the Mexican American war we have the Crimean War, we have the American Civil War, we have the Franco-Prussian War, we have the Russian-Turkish War, we have the Spanish-American War, we have World War I, we have the Russian Civil War, we have World War II, we have the Korean War, we have the Vietnam War, we have the Suez Crisis, we have the Six-Day War, we have the Yom Kippur War, the Iraq-Iran War, the Gulf War, the Bosnian War, the Kosovo War, Afghanistan War, Iraq War, Syrian Civil War, up to now the present. And then I searched out notable localized and regional conflicts since 1844. Okay, so these are major conflicts worldwide. What about local and regional conflicts since 1844? We have the Taiping Rebellion, the Philippine-American War, the Italo-Turkish War, the Greco-Turkish War, the uh, Chaco War, the Indonesian National Revolution, the Sino-Indian War, the Nigerian Civil War, the Troubles, the Cambodian Civil War, the Lebanese Civil War, the Ethiopian Civil War, the Anglo-Indian Civil War, the Sri Lanka Civil War, the Somalia Civil War, the Czechian Wars, the Darfur Conflict, the Yemen Civil War up to present. And then I did a search, total military and civilian deaths from the listed wars and conflicts, approximately anywhere from 180 to 210 million. And you're some guy I'm gonna convince me that we've not been living under a woe since 1844, when 180 to 210 million people have died just by war and bloodshed alone. And that's not counting pestilences. That's not counting earthquakes. That's not counting famines and whatever else. Murders, thefts, all of the like. How many, how many millions, maybe into the billions of people have died since 1844? And somehow you're going to convince me Somehow you're going to convince me that we're waiting for some future thing for Islam to be a woe. Think about it. That's insanity. It just can't work. Okay? Verse 45 is fulfilled. We have been living under a woe and ever since 45 fulfilled, the trouble has increased even more and more, okay? And it's not going to get any better, brethren. It's not going to get any better. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And that's just the reality of, of what it is. We are in the woe. It has been a woe. It's a woe right now. It's going to be a woe perhaps this winter when we're talking about in some areas of this world, 60 to 70% vaccinated at least two to three times are probably going to die from the common cold. How many millions of people will that be? And we're just going to add that on to the numbers of millions that have already died. It's a woe, brethren. We're living in the woe. So don't try to convince me, whoever hears this, this video, watches this, or even this evening seeing this, don't try to convince me that somehow Islam 
is the coming woe. Because that is just plain, for lack of a better word, forgive me for being vulgar, garbage. And with that, I'm going to close in prayer. Father, again, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you for your love and mercy to us. I thank you that it is just so clear. You have, as the prophet has said, you have outlined it so clearly for us in the works of the pioneers, let the dead speak, in the works of inspiration by the prophets you gave us, Ellen White, and the Bible itself, that none need err. There is no reason that any one of us need to be confused about anything as it relates to the truth that will seal us and save us at this time. So I just pray that you help each and every one of us to study for ourselves, to show ourselves approved, to settle into the truth, the sealing message of truth, that we might be sealed and counted worthy for salvation. Help us to let go of the sins that beset us. Forgive us for where we failed to study our and to show ourselves approved that we might help others. And I just pray that anyone that would hear this presentation would be convicted and pricked to their heart that we have been duped. Perhaps it's been done in ignorance and not intentionally, but nonetheless, we have been duped. Help us to walk in the light because time is very short. And I thank you for your love and mercy to us. And I pray all these things in the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen.